Hello, everyone. Ben Johnson here, and I am recording this on the day that I consider my book really officially released. My new book, Perpetual Chess Improvement from New in Chess. I've been saying it's released for a while. I've already done a couple long interviews about the book. I'll be doing a couple more, but now Amazon is shipping. So you can get it on Kindle. You can get it on the New in Chess reader. You can get it uh, for Forward Chess. So now I feel like anyone in the world can read the book instantly if they want to and can get the physical copy within a couple of days if they want to. The only format where the book is still not available is audiobook. Uh, we're doing some post-production on that, and we hope that the audiobook will be available in December. Uh, one thing I should mention, the book is you know, 80 to 85% words. It's mostly words as you just go through it with some chess diagrams basically inserted for fun. But for that reason, it's well-suited to audiobook. It's also well suited to the Kindle and forward chess uh, does enable you to play and the new and chess reader enabled you to play through the chess as well. It does include the full games in the back, but it's mostly prose and snippets. So I wanted to give a brief overview of the book. Regular podcast listeners will know brevity is not my strong suit, but for this one, we're going to try to keep it short and do like a quick overview of what the book's about. So here's the table of contents. Now, you guys should know that New in Chess has a free preview linked from their website. So you can actually see this table of contents as well as a couple chapters, uh, courtesy of New in Chess. But this shows the framework of the book. Uh, so basically wrestling with the question of how to get better at chess. You know, I'm drawing on the insights, not only from top players and trainers, I've of course interviewed so many, but also from accomplished amateurs, uh, the adult improver series. So the first part of the book, I call the four pillars of chess improvement. This is what I settled on as the four most important things uh, that you should, everyone should have in their training regimen and that people actually don't disagree on. Tournament games and their substitutes, game analysis, calculation and pattern recognition, and coaches, chess friends, and mentors. Part two of the book is other aspects of chess you might want to work on. So this is where there's some arguments, like do amateurs overemphasize the opening study? You know, amateurs hear that all the time. Some of them concede that it's true. Others find it frustrating. I present both sides and give uh, a measured opinion. Um, do must you know end games? You know, obviously, there's some landmark books like 100 End Games You Must Know. Dvoretsky's End Game Manual is often recommended, but quite challenging. And then there's books like Silman's End Game Course. Um, and it can be so hard. There's so many aspects of chess to work on. So the question is do end games need to be studied as a standalone, or can you just review your games and review the end games when they come up? Uh, mimicking the masters, do we still need to study all the classics, or has that changed in the modern era? where young players and neural networks are able to get great at the game uh, just from iterating, just from playing and learning on their own. Board visualization and blindfold chess, I think this can be a challenge, especially who, for people who came to chess as adults. Uh, how to approach speed chess? Is speed chess good for our games or not? People are constantly arguing about it. Uh, tactics Redux, that one's about the woodpecker method. Pros and cons of the approach of repeating tactics as opposed to solving new exercises. Then I have a big section working on the game away from your, bo your board. This is kind of the least chess-centric section. Uh, I have a chapter about uh, status and titles and why chess players can uh, really become uh, preoccupied with them. I'm certainly no exception, but I do find it a fascinating topic, how checklists can help your thinking processes, habits and identity, and how that can help you maintain a daily practice. Uh, dealing with plateaus, deliberate practice and chess study, over the board tournament routines. Um, that one's about basically, and this is a theme of the book that you've got to decide what is my primary goal? What is your why? Because if you're trying to maximize your performance, you should be taking it pretty seriously, treating it like, like an athlete would. But if you're just trying to catch up with friends and move the pieces around, have a few drinks at night, that's fine too. But you need to clarify your goals before you go in and uh, make a plan accordingly. Um, playing against kids, I give some tips for that. I mean, I'm no, uh, you know, kids are very strong at chess. So I, I don't have a huge number of secrets to uncork, but I, I do, I have given the topic some thought and share some advice, rest, fitness, and mindfulness. This stuff, even if it doesn't help your chess, will make you a healthier person. And there are some chess players who I cite 
uh, who've had some success with various practices, whether it be based on exercise or meditation. Then we go to tools of improvement. So I give a bunch of chess recommendations within the book, um, talk about how best to use chess.com and Lee Chess or any other play zone type chess uh, site that you might be using. Uh, talk about chess base and lead chess studies, weigh the pros and cons, depending on your level. I mean, obviously they're both great products. Um, extracting lessons from engines, Stockfish and Leela in particular, optimizing chessable. As I give book recommendations, I also give che chessable course recommendations and then chess YouTube, which is not my, uh, you know, not my playground. I'm more of a, a words guy. But obviously, with all the people I've interviewed over the years, I've checked out a lot of YouTube con content. So I give recommendations, whether you're looking for entertainment or improvement, and just make the point that if you are trying to work on chess improvement from uh, chess YouTube, make sure you're interacting with it actively. And that's pretty much it. Then I just wrap it up from there. There is an index of games so that even though there's snippets, you can play through uh, most of the entire games if you prefer to do that. Before I let you go, I did want to show you uh, one chess position from the book. Again, the chess positions, I feel like they're kind of like a bonus, but the way it worked is I wrote the book in words first and then went looking for chess positions that had to do with either the stories being told or a concept being illustrated. So in this game, 12-year-old uh, Viswanathan Anand is just making a mark, and this is presented in a chapter about the importance of community. I talk about how not only do amateurs need a social network in order to be able to stick with chess and in order to augment their learning and make it a more enjoyable and sustainable pursuit. I talk about how even the young champions uh, were very we're very lucky to have networks around and someone like Bobby Fisher, you don't consider as like, you know, he's got this persona of a lone wolf. I mean, it's unfortunately there's some reality based on how he spent his later years, um, which were marred by me mental illness and misogyny and anti-Semitism and obviously not an admirable person in his later years, but in his developing years. And I've interviewed a lot of people who knew young Fisher. Um, he was, you know, hanging out in chess circles all the time. And uh, Carlson, of course, grew up in a place where chess was not um, super popular in Norway, but he did. He came along at the right time because Grandmaster Seaman Agdestein, the first uh, Norwegian Grandmaster, had just opened a chess school um, for young elite talents at the time that Magnus burst on the scene. And Viswanathan Anand, similarly, chess was not booming in Chennai. There was like one international master, but if he happened to open a chess institute uh, near where Anand lived in Chennai. And his sister happened to walk by it and see it and say, like, hey, you seem to like chess. You should go there. So anyway, there's little stories like that throughout the book but it, this is a game i found from when anan was 12 years old so it's black to move you can pause the video if you like try to find the best move and then i'll tell you what actually happened in this game so pause it for as long as you like and then we will find out what young vishy did here so a lot of you are probably keyed on ideas of trying to checkmate the white king uh, involving rook takes h2, bishop takes queen h4, stuff like that. And that is the right idea, but we've got to be careful because our back rank is exposed and white can ha can check us perpetually if we're not careful. Um, so Anand did hit on that idea, but he didn't play the perfect execution at age 12. So the best move actually is the counterintuitive rook h7. And the idea of this move is that the queen doesn't have a lot of squares. It basically has to go to g6. And once it does, now the stage is set for us to sack our rook. And after they take, our queen comes in. And yes, white has a check. But if we go to g7, suddenly the well has run, run dry. There's no more checks for white. And um, white's going to get checkmated on h2 unless they, you know, they basically it's unstoppable. So that would have been the even better way to play is with rook h7. But Vichy had the very creative idea to play bishop e6, which if you're playing some young phenom and they play a move like that, you've got to be like, that smells funny. This guy is up to something. And he sure enough was. So he's got a similar idea. His idea is to cover the back rank. And it turns out that if you feed it to Stockfish here in 2023, if white plays queen takes bishop, rook takes, pawn takes, we basically have dynamic equality. Stockfish gives this like 0.45 or something for white. Uh, so it's anybody's game, the game goes on. But I mean, it's understandable that 
Vishy's young opponent. I mean, of course, you'd be fishy. You'd be suspicious of a move like this, but it's totally understandable that he instead played pawn takes bishop. And now it's GG's because the stage is set for this sacrifice. Rook takes bishop takes queen h4. So that was a puzzle and checkmate on h2 is, of course, unstoppable. So that was a puzzle that I included basically just for fun in the context of discussing chess culture and how important it was that Anand and Magnus and Fisher and so many others found the chess network just as amateurs should. Um, but again, the book is predominantly words, and I said I was going to keep this short. So I'm going to wrap this up. If you'd enjoyed this, you might want to check out the book, Perpetual Chess Improvement, available almost everywhere you get your chess books, or you can wait for the audio book. All right. Thanks for watching.